Greetings, this is Greg. This is the final episode in the P-47 Thunderbolt series. I'm going to start by summarizing the key points in this series so far while trying to address the more common questions that have come up. Then I'm going to make the case that the P-47 made a larger contribution to the victory in Europe than the P-51 and may have been the most important Allied fighter over Europe. I'm sure that last statement is already ruffling some feathers, but hear me out, and I think the facts and timeline of events will speak volumes. The Thunderbolt was designed primarily as a high-altitude fighter. It had three main features, giving it a lot of performance. First, we have the 2800 cubic inch radial engine. That's about 45.9 liters of displacement. In other words, it was a really big engine at the time. Next, we have the supercharging system, which features a mechanically driven supercharger plus an exhaust driven turbocharger and a large intercooler. That allowed the big engine to generate a lot of power up to very high altitudes. Last but not least, we have the excellent Seversky designed wing. This was at a time when almost everyone else was going with the NACA wing profile, the de Havilland Mosquito being a notable exception. The Seversky wing was very good, at least as good, and usually superior to other wings of the era. It's even competitive with the later NACA low drag airfoils used on planes like the P-51 Mustang and the A-26 Invader. These features, and some others, gave the Thunderbolt a lot of speed at altitudes. Even the early B as in Bravo and C as in Charlie models could reach 425 to 430 miles per hour. Many D models were modified by crew chiefs to run up at higher manifold pressure limits and could go even faster. Up high, the plane had enough speed to outrun 109Gs and FW-190As with ease and was far faster than the Spitfire Mark V. Now, as the war progressed, there were faster variants of some of those airplanes. Um, 109G-10, for example, G-14, G-14AS, 190 Dora. Those planes were all pretty good up at altitude, but the Thunderbolt got faster as well and generally retained its high altitude speed advantage. The 47 Mike and November models could do 472 and 467 miles per hour respectively. The 47 November's numbers are taken at a higher weight and are very conservative. These numbers make the Thunderbolt faster than any other U.S. plane that saw combat during the war. The only planes to see combat that were faster were some very low production types, for example, Germany's TA-152, and even then, it's only faster under very specific conditions and while spraying with its GM-1 system, aka nitrous oxide. At low altitudes, it's another matter. In these conditions, the P-47 speed becomes average. For example, down at sea level, most P-47s with water methanol injection have maximum speeds of around 340 miles per hour for a D model and 364 for a November. That's not slow. It's about average compared to competing fighters. I suppose that considering this plane is biased towards high altitude, that's really pretty good. For comparison, an FW-190A8 could do about 350 miles per hour at sea level, so it's about 10 miles per hour faster than a P-47D. So considering that the 190A8 is a plane that's designed with low altitude combat in mind, and it's 10 miles an hour faster than the Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt's not looking so bad here. Now maximum dive speeds are the next topic. I cover this uh, in part two of this series in great detail. Dive speeds are kind of an interesting subject. Oh, on the subject of details, I'm not going to rehash every source or explain aerodynamics all over again. This is just a summary. Please see the original episodes for more in-depth information on different types of airspeed indications, dive speed, performance, etc. If you start getting lost here, you just might have to watch those earlier episodes. Now, there are different considerations for dive speeds. At high altitudes, it's usually Mach number limited, and at low altitudes, it's airspeed limited. There are other factors as well. Acceleration in the dive, ease of recovery, the room it takes you to recover, a lot more. Overall, the P-47 was the fastest diving piston engine plane of World War II. That doesn't mean it was the fastest diving in all conditions. As an example, a Spitfire Mark 14 cannot remotely keep up with a Thunderbolt November in a dive at lower altitudes. Its maximum speed is 470 miles per hour indicated. 
Thunderbolt dive speeds are 500 for all early Thunderbolts and 564 indicated for the November models. Furthermore, those are indicated speeds. The actual speed differences are greater because the Thunderbolt's airspeed indicator reads low, as is typical of U.S. airspeed indicators, and the Spitfire's indicator reads high, typical of British airspeed indicators. The Spitfire's indicator reads at least 12 miles per hour high at that speed. In other words, a 47 November can outdive a Spitfire Mark 14 by over 100 miles per hour. However, at higher altitudes, the Spitfire can dive a bit faster due to its higher Mach number limitation. But overall, the Thunderbolt's dive performance is far superior, meaning it's faster through uh, by a greater degree and through a greater range of altitudes. It's overall, overall, it's faster. The Thunderbolt can outdive every German fighter for which I can find numbers except the ME 262, except the 262, and I found numbers for almost all of the common variants of 109s, 190s, and more. A lot of people have mentioned that they think the Hawker Typhoon and Tempest could outdive the Thunderbolt. That opinion has some sound logic behind it, but overall, the Thunderbolt is a little bit better in this regard. If we compare the Typhoon with a P-47 B, C, or D, the ones that fought in Europe, we find they are very close. At first glance, it appears that the Typhoon has a higher maximum dive speed. The numbers listed in the manual are 500 for the Thunderbolt and 525 for the Typhoon. I often see charts online that use, numbers, uh, that use these numbers for comparison. However, these charts are apparently made up by non-aviation types that don't have the complete picture. When we correct the indicated airspeed numbers to calibrated airspeeds, which is what matters here, we have 512 for the Thunderbolt, 501 for the Typhoon. So they're very close, but all variants of the Thunderbolt outdive the Typhoon at low altitudes. Now, in terms of Mach numbers for diving at high altitude, I can't find any data for the Typhoon, possibly because the Typhoon didn't operate all that high anyway. In most variants, the engines are out of breath anywhere over 20,000 feet. The situation's a bit different for the Tempest. The Tempest has a maximum indicated number of 540. That's pretty fast. It corrects to 518. The P-47 November has a maximum indicated of 564, which corrects to 576. So at low altitudes, the Tempest will just barely outdive a P-47D, 512 versus 518, but not a November. Uh, we don't have information for the P-47 Mike, by the way, so uh, that's kind of a downer. Now, I should point out that the Tempest 5 and P-47 are within about eight months of, of each other in introduction dates. So although the Tempest 5 didn't fight in Asia and the Thunderbolt November didn't fight in Europe, uh, they are contemporaries of each other. Now, at high altitudes, the temperature is Mach number limited. The highest Mach number I can find for the Tempest is 0 0.80, faster than an ME-109 or FW-190, but not quite as fast as the Thunderbolt, which can run 0.82. So in the discussion of which is faster in terms of dive speed, Tempest or Thunderbolt, yes, an argument could be made for the Tempest because it's faster than all the D-model Thunderbolts at low altitude. However, I still have to give this to the Thunderbolt because all models of the Thunderbolt are faster than all models of the Tempest in a dive at high altitude and that's where the ultimate dive speed is going to be reached. So in the truest sense the Thunderbolt has a higher maximum dive speed than the Tempest. Plus you've got the Thunderbolt November which is faster than the Tempest at all altitudes and that's the variant of the Thunderbolt that's closest to the Tempest in terms of um, of their first operational flights, although they never flew in the same theater. The Tempest did not operate in the Pacific, as far as I know, and I'm absolutely certain the Thunderbolt November never operated in Europe. There's also the Thunderbolt Mike. I don't find any dive speed data for it. I do think it's the same as the Thunderbolt D model. I just can't prove that. So about that 0.82 number, and by the way, I'm hoping that I've made a chart and put it up and you guys are looking at it for the Thunderbolt dive speeds. Um, I haven't made it yet, but I'm just worried I might have fum um, fumbled some of that verbiage in that last description of dive speeds. Uh, anyway, about that 0.82 number, and I've been dreading having this part of the discussion for a while, not for any technical reasons. Uh, you'll see why.
I am aware that Eric Brown tested the Thunderbolt and said that its Mach limit was a very low 0.71. People keep bringing this up, so I need to talk about it. And I've been dreading this because I think Eric Brown is wrong. And I don't want to come out sounding like I'm anti-Eric Brown. I'm not. The reality is everybody can be wrong sometimes. And there is a mountain of evidence that's against Eric Brown uh, in regards to Thunderbolt Mach numbers. I think he was probably right about a lot of other stuff. In fact, not only is he an icon of aviation, he is the real deal. There are people that are famous that probably shouldn't be. Um... I, I don't want to get into that right now, but if I was to make a list of the top 10 pilots of all time, I think Eric Brown would be on that list. He's, he's a big deal. I just think he's wrong here. Everybody can be wrong. So let's look at some of the other evidence. And all of this is, you know, all the source material is put up in the video on screen in uh, part two of this series. So the U.S. Army Air Force, NACA at both Langley and the Ames Research Center, those are two different places and the Royal Air Force all tested the Thunderbolt, and they all came up with much higher Mach numbers than Eric Brown. Eric Brown came up with 0.71. Everybody else came up with 0.814 or 0.815 maybe to 0.836. The RAF's Air Fighting Development Unit is the outfit that came up with 0.836. I tend to use 0.82 because it's, it's kind of an average, but also it's the number straight from Republic, so it makes sense to me. Now, I've heard an argument that uh, when Eric Brown did the testing, they had different equipment, it was better, so forth, so that sort of stuff. I think that's a bunch of nonsense. Um, NACA had an unlimited wartime budget. I've mentioned this before. They could, they could build about what any equipment, whatever test equipment they wanted, they could have it made. Um, whatever they wanted to test to destruction, they could do that. They had a lot of experience with measuring Mach numbers. They were very concerned about it. And... A lot of that same equipment was used in development of the Bell X-1, which, of course, was the first airplane to break the sound barrier. So, yeah, NACA knew what they were doing when it came to testing Mach limits, and they tested the Thunderbolt up to, I think, 8.2 or 8.3, for sure 8.2, and they even tested the Thunderbolt's maneuverability up to Mach 0.78. So uh, the primary source material is just hugely weighed against Eric Brown on this. Then we have a lot of secondary material. We know from pilot reports that Thunderbolts at altitude would easily outdive German fighters. Those German fighters had limits from 0.75 to about 0.78. The FW-190s uh, were the faster ones. They had 0.78 limits. Now, if the Thunderbolts were truly limited to 0.71, then 109s and 190s would have escaped them by diving, and pilot reports don't suggest that that happens. In fact, it's usually the opposite. Uh, the exception there is sometimes the German planes could escape by diving, but that was earlier, and we're going to talk about this later in the episode, but there was a period of time during the war when the Thunderbolts were not allowed to dive and chase the German fighters. They had to stay with the bombers. Again, that's coming up. That'll be covered. So the vast majority of pilot reports suggest that Thunderbolts could easily outdive German fighters or about anything else. When they decided to put the nose down, they were able to overtake and shoot down German fighters. One of the pilots who wrote about the Thunderbolt's dive speed was Robert S. Johnson. I've mentioned him before. Not only was he a high-scoring U.S. ace with 28 kills, all of those kills against fighters, by the way, very few of them two-seaters. I think they were all fighters. A few, maybe three of them were two-seat fighters, on uh, 110s, 210s, that sort of thing. So not only was he a high-scoring ace, um, almost all of his scores were against the Luftwaffe at the time when the Luftwaffe was very strong. But not only that, he was one of the most experienced U.S. pilots in the European theater. He became the chief test pilot for Republic. I think we can consider him an expert on the issue of P-47 dive speeds. So either Eric Brown was wrong or his test aircraft had some sort of problem. Um, there seems to be this sort of ridiculous worship of a single pilot's word over the entire aviation industry from the period, including every other pilot that discusses the subject. And I... I think that really needs to end. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. There is one more factor favoring the later D-model Thunderbolts in diving comparisons with other World War II fighters. The Thunderbolt was one of the few with dive recovery flaps. Now, these are not on the November models. Um, they had to change the wing, and that involved fuel tanks in the wing, and they couldn't put them on. But 
late model D models have them. And a Thunderbolt pilot that had a plane so equipped could fly right up to or even slightly beyond the Mach limit with confidence. Um, and he could do that for two reasons. One, he'd have confidence that the plane would not come apart. That wasn't the Thunderbolt's problem when it reached its Mach limit. Uh, and he would have, of course, the confidence that he could recover if he had these installed. You deploy the dive recovery flaps and, uh, and you're golden. That's very different from some other airplanes that were on the verge of disintegrating. You know, if your Mach number is 0.80, but you know at 0.805 the tail comes off, you're probably never really going to go 0.80. Uh, the Thunderbolt could honestly do that 0.82 with, with no real risk to the pilot. So, in short, no single airplane had the fastest dive speed in all conditions. However, overall, the Thunderbolt was the fastest diving World War II propeller-driven airplane. Moving on, the Thunderbolt is reasonably well armored. What sets it apart is, in terms of ruggedness, is all the secondary protection for the pilot. These include self-sealing fuel tanks, and of course most airplanes had self-sealing fuel tanks, but in the Thunderbolt, the size, construction, and location of them give a lot of protection to the pilot. Then of course there's the big engine up front, the Razorback versions have a roll bar in case it rolls over after a crash landing, and they all have a crash skid. These all contribute to the safety of the airplane, and these are parts of the reasons that the Thunderbolt Aces, the top 10 Thunderbolt Aces, all survived the war. Um, armor and pilot protection are just a big part of that. I cover armor and pilot protection extensively in Part 3. There's probably more there than you really want to know. Climb rate is the P-47's weakest category, although it's actually not bad. The original 2,000 horsepower planes with the thin-bladed props were some of the slowest climbing fighters of their period, at least in low and medium altitudes. Of course, the plane wasn't meant to fight there. At high altitudes, even the early P-47s had competitive climb performance with just about everything else. However, as the war progressed, they bumped up the power, first to 2,300, then 2,600, then 2,800 horsepower. This extra power, plus the newer, better propellers, made the P-47s climb performance competitive at all altitudes. At this point, it could outclimb many other airplanes, especially at high speeds and even by, even by greater margins at high altitudes. At lower altitudes, especially at low speeds, it would still be outclimbed by 109s, but the gap was close enough so that 109s could not escape the Thunderbolt's guns while climbing, at least not normally. Robert S. Johnson makes it clear that 109s were able to escape his guns with a steep climb until his plane was equipped with later propellers, after which he says that never happened again. Francis Gabrowski, whom Robert S. Johnson refers to as the best pilot he ever met, and that means a lot, said that his P-47 could escape enemy aircraft by flying in a spiral climb, which at high altitudes they could not follow. There's a video with Gabrowski talking about this. I'll link it in the description. This was possible due to the turbo supercharging system on the P-47, which is explained in earlier articles. The overall takeaway should be that early P-47s only have a climb advantage at high altitudes, and then it's usually pretty small. At low and medium altitudes, they had poor climb performance. The later versions with water injection and better propellers had decent but not stellar climb performance at low and medium altitudes, and were generally superior at higher, higher altitudes, especially above 25,000 feet. Maneuverability, not the Thunderbolt strong suit, but it's not as bad as people think. If we look at a 2300 or 2600 Thunderbolt, 2600 horsepower that is, Thunderbolt with a contemporary 109G, well, this is what it's going to look like. The Thunderbolt has superior roll rate at all speeds and altitudes. At very high altitudes, the Thunderbolt has advantage in both turn radius and rate. That's because the 109 runs out of power. It doesn't have enough power to uh, make up for the extra drag uh, when the plane's in a turn. Now, at very high speeds at any altitudes, both planes are G-limited by the pilot's tolerance. That means turn radius and rate are going to be pilot-limited in this case. Although, I do have to give a slight advantage to the German planes here due to the seating position in German fighters. I say slight advantage, I actually don't have any way of measuring that, but there's definitely an advantage. In a turn fight... High induced drag will slow both planes and they will eventually settle to their best sustained turn speeds, at least if they're going to hold altitude. High altitudes, the P-47, will generally win this contest. 
It depends a little on the exact altitude and the specific versions of the 47 and 109 we're talking about, not to mention fuel loads and other variables. At low and medium altitudes, the 109's turn radius, radius, not rate, is almost always going to beat the P-47s, and by a significant margin. However, the P-47's turn rate is competitive, meaning that down low, a P-47 can compete with a 109, even in a one versus one dogfight, which the P-47 really shouldn't be doing down low, but it can. But in that situation, it's critical to avoid a one circle fight with a 109, especially at low altitudes. That's absolute certain death in a Thunderbolt. One circle fight, low speed, low altitude, very bad. Now, if you want to know more about this, please watch episode five in this series. I just can't summarize maneuverability very effectively in a few short paragraphs. I'll mention that in a two circle fight, the, tur the Thunderbolt's turn rate puts it on or near even terms with the 109. However, I have never read a single thing from the World War II era that indicates that pilots of this time collectively understood turn geometry in regards to one versus two circle fights. And I think that's kind of interesting. Um, I'm sure that there were some individuals that did. I mean, it seems to me that somebody had to have thought about this stuff. But I have zero indication that this was commonly taught in the U.S. Army Air Force or even taught anywhere at all. P-47 takes a lot of unjustified criticism over its perceived short range. The high U.S. bomber losses during the 1943 raids on Schweinfurt, there were two of them, are often based, or correction, are often blamed on the Thunderbolt's inability to escort the bombers that far from their bases in England. The truth is that the Thunderbolts had the ability to escort to Schweinfurt from very early in 1943, well before those raids, it had the ability to escort to Berlin in 1944, could have had that earlier, and the Thunderbolt November could escort bombers 1,000 miles from base. The fact that the bombers were flying unescorted was due to USAAF leadership decision-making, not due to technical limitations of the P-47 Thunderbolt. I cover this extensively in part six of this series. In fact, I think that's the most historically significant episode on this channel. Eh, maybe not. I have to think about that. Moving on. I want to address a few of the criticisms of this viewpoint, the viewpoint that the Thunderbolt could have escorted to Schweinfurt, um, except for leadership decision-making. A few criticisms have come up in the comments, so let's talk about those. First, quite a few people have pointed out that the drop tanks needed were simply not available until late 1943. Yeah, that's true, but it's not a technical limitation. It's the result of very bad decisions by the leadership. Drop tanks existed for the P-47 from very early in 1943. Arguing that they couldn't get the drop tanks over to Europe when they managed to get the planes, parts, fuel, pilots, everything else, that whole logistics chain, uh, that just seems like a silly argument to me. Next, we have the argument that the early drop tanks were not suitable for high altitude. Okay, this argument falls on its face for several reasons. It is true that for use at high altitude, drop tanks need to be slightly pressurized. And it's true that certain early tanks didn't have this feature. I'll give you three reasons why that doesn't matter. First of all, there is no limitation on the altitude of the early 200-gallon drop tank. That's in the 1943 manual, the earlier one. More importantly, lack of tank pressurization is something that is technically trivial to rectify, especially as compared with the complexity of something like a World War II fighter plane. Whenever someone des decided to take care of that, it got done in no time. It's easy to do because the system to pressurize the tank is already on the plane, at least in the case of every single World War II fighter. The British even built what was essentially a paper mache tank, paper mache drop tank for the Thunderbolt, it worked just fine at high altitude. So to argue that the U.S. aircraft industry was going to need years to do this or something is just silly. The most telling reason is that as soon as Hap Arnold decided that U.S. fighters in Europe were going to have drop tanks for use in high altitude escorting, production of them increased by about 700% almost overnight, and they were airlifted to Europe and put into service almost immediately. It's a bit difficult to get exact dates on some of this stuff, but it appears there were only about six weeks from the time Arnold decided to go with drop tanks 
and the time P-47 squadrons in Europe were fully equipped with them. Now, there were some drop tanks in the Pacific that did not have provisions for tank pressurization. That was because those tanks were locally made, too, again, due to failings for U.S. Air Force leadership, U.S. Army Air Force leadership. And uh, the P-47s in the Pacific just didn't need it because they weren't going that high. The bottom line here is that as soon as they decided to use drop tanks to extend the Thunderbolt's range for escorting, they did so immediately, and doing so was trivial. There were never any technical limitations stopping them. There was one comment by Trent, who has some very good articles on World War II aviation. He brought up a legitimate range issue for the Thunderbolt. That's oil capacity. Legitimate, but not really all that limiting. Air-cooled radials from the World War II era use a lot of oil, so much so that the rate of oil consumption is almost as much of a consideration for flight planning as fuel quantity, and that is literally true. I am not exaggerating. The Thunderbolt's oil tank holds 28 gallons, which sounds like a lot. However, at the economical maximum cruise setting, the engine will burn about 5.25 gallons of oil per hour. At a power setting for minimal oil consumption, it's going to burn 3.25 gallons per hour, and at maximum continuous, it will be at just over 8 gallons per hour. So how much of a problem will this be? Let's consider a P-47D, an earlier one, with triple drop tanks, uh, dual 108s and a 150 uh, for the drop tanks, which was a common configuration. Then add in the 305 gallons of internal fuel. We have 671 gallons of fuel, easily enough to escort all the way to Berlin. At escorting speeds and altitudes, the plane's going to burn about 150 gallons of fuel per hour and about five gallons of oil per hour. That's about four and a half hours of fuel supply and about 5.3 hours of oil. Obviously, you don't want to run the supply of either down to zero, and there are other factors here. More fuel and oil will be used during climb, less during descent. Pilot technique is a factor, as is engine condition. As you add more fuel with either bigger drop tanks or later um, D models, which have the 370 gallons of internal fuel capacity, it becomes a closer thing and becomes a factor. However, it was manageable, and that's proven by the fact that Thunderbolts ranged to Berlin and beyond. This picture shows a P-47 over the ruins of Berghof, one of Hitler's residences. Oil consumption varies a lot during the life of an air-cooled engine. Thus, this issue may have been and probably was managed by tighter times between engine overhauls or by simply using the higher time engines on the shorter range missions sort of like what we know they did with the war-weary search airplanes. That whole idea isn't really too unusual in aviation, so it's certainly reasonable to think they may have done that. Of course, solving this oil concern wasn't a big deal anyway. Adding in a larger oil tank was easy, and as soon as they needed to do it, that's exactly what they did. I'm not sure exactly when this happened, but all Thunderbolt Novembers, which of course carry more fuel, have the larger 50-gallon oil tank. Let's move on to the Thunderbolt's effect on the war. Most people are under the impression that the primary mission of the USAAF in Europe was to destroy German industry, bomb their factories so they can't produce planes, tanks, and so on. That's not really true, and it's absolutely not true from mid-1943 on. The primary mission of the USAAF for most of their time in Europe was to establish and maintain air superiority. It's time for a short history review. In May of 1943, Churchill and Roosevelt met for the third Washington Conference, often called the Trident Conference. It was during this conference that the military leaders from the U.S. and the U.K. met and planned out the cross-channel invasion that would take place on D-Day. Now, you might think that these meetings would have taken place in this building, the newly completed Pentagon. But in fact, they took place here at the U.S. Federal Reserve. I find it interesting that the invasion, called Operation Overlord, was planned at the Federal Reserve. I think some of you get what I'm putting down here. I'm not going to make a video on this because it's totally outside the scope of this channel. But uh, it's a fascinating subject, although somewhat politically incorrect. We know a lot of what happened at this meeting, thanks to the publication of this 518-page document. 
I want to bring your attention to this page. It shows that the planners put air superiority first on the list of essential things to accomplish before a cross-channel invasion. That may seem obvious now, but if you look at the actions of the USAAF or the RAF up to this point in time, it's clear that there hadn't been any real efforts to get air, superior, air superiority over Europe. In fact, at this point in the war, the Germans had demonstrated their ability to gain air superiority, at least for short periods of time, over the English Channel or over the European continent. There were two major examples of this in 1942. The first was in February during Operation Cerberus, and the second in August over Dieppe. I don't feel the need to cover these events in much detail in this video. Just know that at Dieppe, the Allies, meaning mostly the British, attempted a cross-channel invasion at the port city of Dieppe in France. The invasion attempt failed miserably, and the Allies were pushed back into the sea, largely due to the Luftwaffe. Obviously, the planners of Operation Overlord knew about this and learned from it. Thus, establishing air superiority was given a top priority. The Trident Conference ended on the 25th of May, and on the 21st of July, the U.S. War Department released a document clarifying the need to establish air superiority over Europe. Of course, at this point, they couldn't specifically reference the coming invasion on D-Day, but point two makes it pretty obvious what they're talking about. This is further clarified here, where the first basic task is to destroy hostile air forces. It's very clear that from late July on, the main objective for the 8th Air Force became the destruction of the Luftwaffe, not of specific ground targets. I know this isn't commonly to understood today. Judging from the comment section here and on other channels, most people seem to think that the objective of U.S. bombing in Europe was to destroy German industry. This line of thinking manifests itself in several ways. Uh, extreme amount of concern over the accuracy of the Norden bomb site or how it was affected by clouds, that sort of stuff. Also, a lot of focus on bomb tonnage with zero consideration, zero, on how that would affect the efforts to destroy the Luftwaffe. For example, I hear over and over that the U.S. should have used the excellent de Havilland Mosquito instead of the four-engine heavy bombers like B-17s and B-24s, the argument being that the Mosquito could carry the same bomb load and was fast enough to make two trips in one night. Um, the main problem with that idea, and there are many, but the main problem is that this would have a negligible effect on the Luftwaffe. The Germans were not going to lose a lot of airplanes or pilots chasing mosquitoes around at night. They might get frustrated by doing it, but they won't lose enough to cause the levels of attrition needed for the Allies to establish air superiority by D-Day. A second problem is that the 4,000-pound uh, cookie, every payload everyone talks about, was a single bomb, a blockbuster bomb, often called a cookie. This was essentially a big cylinder filled with explosives. It had no fins. It was not accurate. If you were dropping it at night or uh, certainly at, from 25,000 feet, uh, the best you could hope for was to hit a city. Hitting a specific building just wasn't going to happen. The other comment I see all the time is, that the U.S. should have sent its bombers in with heavier payloads. For example, uh, even a kindergarten level of research will show that the B-17s and B-24s would typically carry four to 8,000 pounds of bombs, but that they could carry more. So why not load them up? Uh, for example, the B-17 could carry 12,800 pounds internally and more on the external hard points. So why reduce the payload so much? In some cases, Payload had to be reduced uh, to uh, increase range, but that wasn't usually the reason. There were plenty of targets in Germany they could have reached with over 12,000 pounds. The reasons had more to do with daylight bomber formations. The bombers had to fly in tight formations to provide defensive firepower, supporting defensive firepower. It takes a lot of fuel just to get all those planes into formation. Obviously, they don't all take off at the same time. The weight of fuel um, from the first airplane that took off has to come out of the bomb load. Then, while in formation, the planes can't be at the ragged edge of their performance limits because they need to be able to speed up and slow down to stay in formation, especially considering that the last planes that took off were heavier, so there has to be a pretty decent performance reserve there. 
Last, of course, when the plane returns to base, they don't all land at the same time, so extra fuel is going to be needed there. There are other factors as well, but the key point here is that had the USAAF wanted to increase tonnage, they could have flown at night in a much less structured uh, environment regarding formations, less structured formations, and they could have carried far heavier payloads, but that would not have accomplished their primary goal. The daylight formations forced the German fighters up to 25,000 feet, where U.S. escorting fighters, especially P-47s, generally had the advantage. Not only did this help the U.S. fighters shoot down more Germans, an often overlooked fact is that the bombers themselves shot down a lot of enemy aircraft, thus contributing to the Luftwaffe's demise. Now, to give credit where it's due, the Luftwaffe for a time did an incredible job defending the Reich. They were generally trading single-engine fighters for four-engine bombers with a kill ratio of about one to one. That means the U.S. was losing 10 men and a bomber with four complex turbo-supercharged engines, not to mention the whole Norden bomb site, which is tied into an autopilot. I mean, it's a lot of money there. For uh, mostly single-engine fighters um, with one crew member, and often the German pilot bailed out and lived to fight again. Of course, there were some twin-engine German fighters in the mix as well. Now, statistically, you'd think this might, look, might have looked good for Germany, and for a time it, it at least looked okay. But the Italian, the, not the Italians, I'm sorry, the Allies could afford the attrition, and the Germans simply couldn't. Let's get back to fighters and to the P-47. In January of 1944, the commander of the 8th Air Force, Jimmy Doolittle, who was the real deal and should not be confused with government or military bureaucrats, saw a sign at Fighter Command that read, quote, The first duty of 8th Air Force fighters is to bring the bombers back alive, unquote. Doolittle was unhappy with that. He changed it to, quote, The first duty of 8th Air Force fighters is to destroy German fighters, unquote. That really indicates a change in philosophy, and he put it into practice, as seen here in the 8th Tactical History document. Previously, fighters were ordered to stay with the bombers and not free-range around looking for fights. And it wasn't just the USAAF that operated this way. It was pretty standard. In fact, Goering had given similar orders to German fighter pilots during the Battle of Britain. When Doolittle gave the orders allowing the fighters to leave the bombers, this was considered pretty radical, and there was a lot of opposition to it, especially from the bomber people. However, this plan did work and was not only instrumental in pushing back and then wiping out the Luftwaffe, it resulted in far more bomber crews making it back alive. Establishing air superiority meant destroying the Luftwaffe, or at least pushing it out of the area in which you intend to operate your sea or ground forces. Destroying the Luftwaffe primarily means killing the pilots. Bombing aircraft factories, ball bearing plants, and other production facilities would help. But bombing alone could not end German aircraft production. As a matter of fact, for most of the war, despite Allied bombing, production of German fighter planes, armored vehicles, many other weapons of war actually increased. German fighter strength in terms of numbers of fighter aircraft was still very high at the end of 1944 and into 1945. Looking at aircraft production numbers, they stayed high until 1945, and even then were primarily going down because Germany was losing territory due to the ground war in Europe, not because of Allied bombing. That's not to say that Allied bombing wasn't having any effect on production. It was in several ways. The Germans were forced to disperse their factories to hidden facilities, sometimes in forests, sometimes underground. In many cases, they used forced labor. They also had to reprioritize just what they built. As an example, production of bombers declined, leaving more resources to build fighters. It's also worth pointing out that production quality dropped. I don't think there's any question that without Allied bombing, production would have been higher still, and quality would have been higher. So, Allied strategic bombing was having an effect, especially on oil supply. Oil's a particularly easy thing to bomb. But, it was never anywhere close to being able to eliminate the Luftwaffe. Let's get into the statistics showing where and when the destruction of the Luftwaffe happened. These charts come from Strategy for Defeat from the Air Power Research Institute, 
I'll also be including images from the 8th Air Force Tactical Development Book and uh, some other original source material. This chart shows an overall trend of German aircraft losses from the middle of 1940, just before the Battle of Britain, up to June of 1944 when D-Day took place. It's grouped in six-month periods, but it's pretty clear that the losses climbed rapidly through 1943 and through June of 44. It's interesting to note how high non-combat losses were throughout the war. This was not unique to the Luftwaffe. Military flying accidents were very common back then. Uh, training wasn't what it is today, and those planes were much more difficult to handle than, uh, than modern stuff. Looking at these charts, it's clear that the German losses were holding at a fairly steady rate until 1943. Well, what changed in 1943? Actually, quite a lot. The Luftwaffe had significant losses at Stalingrad, Kursk, and Tunisia. If we look at this month by month, theater by theater, we see that in January, while the Battle of Stalingrad was still going on, it started in 42, German losses on the Eastern Front fighting the Soviets far exceeded losses on the Western Front, uh, where they were primarily fighting the British with some relatively small contributions from the U.S. The Germans also suffered losses in the Mediterranean and North Africa. However, the overall trend is clear. As the U.S. Army Air Force built up forces and sent bombing raids into Europe, German aircraft losses increased in the West. Of course, those planes could be replaced. But the bigger problem for Germany was the loss of pilots. Pilot attrition for the year of 1943 was over 140%. Furthermore, the pilots lost were largely well-trained and highly experienced. Replacement pilots had less training in terms of total flight time and far less training in uh, terms of experience flying frontline fighters, in other words, not trainers and stuff. Perhaps even worse was the lack of combat experience. There was no way to replace that. Thus, the quality of German pilots was decreasing. This led to greater losses, which meant more pilots needed to be trained in less time, and there were fewer people with combat experience to try and get those lessons to the new guys. This led to a vicious cycle driving down pilot quality in the Luftwaffe. This vicious cycle continued until the end of the war. It was compounded by the fact that U.S. fighters were now flying aggressive fighter sweeps and attacking German bases. So what does any of this say about the P-47? Well, I think it tells almost the whole, the whole story, at least to the extent that the story can be told through statistics. The Luftwaffe was, if not destroyed, at least rendered ineffectively in certain regions by D-Day, specifically the Normandy region. There's no question that D-Day should have been the Luftwaffe's ultimate time to shine. The entire operation was dependent on slow-moving transport ships, and there were few easier targets in World War II. Other than a few nuisance attacks, the Luftwaffe created almost no meaningful resistance on D-Day. German aircraft didn't sink a single ship on D-Day. Well, I, I, I should amend that. Some Allied ships were sunk on D-Day when they struck mines, and as the Germans did use mine-laying aircraft, it's possible that some were sunk by those mines that had been previously laid by aircraft. Also, the USS Meredith hit a mine on D-Day and then was finished off by German aircraft three days later, June 9th. So the Luftwaffe had some very limited success, but caused minimal problems for the invasion fleet and in no way was a threat to the success of the operation. So why do I think the P-51, correction, the P-47 Thunderbolt was the most important fighter on the Western Front? On one hand, we have the question of which U.S. fighter shot down the most aircraft over continental Europe. As with all statistics from the war, it's a bit murky, but it probably is the P-51 Mustang. However, I think a more, more important question is when were the planes shot down? We tend to look at air-to-air -air or air-to-ground uh, destruction in terms of raw numbers, and that's fine to a point, but we have to recognize that shooting down a highly trained German combat, combat veteran in October of 1943 was a much bigger deal than shooting down an ill-trained rookie 
on its first combat flight in a plane built by slave labor in late 1944. Combine that with the huge importance of D-Day, and I have to rank the action of U.S. fighters from mid-43 up to June of 44 as more critical to the war effort than anything from July 44 and later. Now, more critical to the war effort. Please don't think I'm discounting the bravery of the post-D-Day flying. I'm not. Um, I recently read some really scary stuff on post-D-Day flying, which I'll show you guys in a few minutes. Anyway, the U.S. Army Air Force fighter pilots played a huge role up to the end of the war. Many were killed in dangerous ground attack missions. My point is that these missions, while dangerous, were less critical to the war effort than the pre-D-Day destruction of the Luftwaffe. The U.S. fighter primarily responsible for destruction of the Luftwaffe prior to D-Day was the P-47. The P-38 Lightning was far less successful in terms of destroying German aircraft, and the high-altitude capable Mustang, that's the one with the Merlin engine, didn't start escorting bombers until December of 1943, really January of 44. Thus, the vast majority of USAAF air-to-air -air kills in 1943 on Germany's Western Front were scored by P-47s. Then we have to consider the five months in 1944 leading up to D-Day. While the last half of 43 caused serious attrition problems for the Luftwaffe, remember their attrition, pilot attrition for the year was 140%, it became totally unmanageable when the USAAF launched a big offensive in February of 1944. This is often called the Big Week. During February of 44, the Luftwaffe suffered huge losses. 33% of its single-engine fighters and 17.9% of its fighter pilots. Now, the Luftwaffe also dished out a lot of punishment. U.S. losses were huge, no question about that. However, the U.S. Army Air Force could absorb those losses due to greater production and far greater pilot training capacity. Big Week was the beginning of of the unstoppable downward fall of the Luftwaffe. That, that really marked the, the unstoppable end was coming. What Allied fighter do you think played the biggest role here? The contributions of the Spitfire and P-38 were relatively minimal. The Spitfire just couldn't go far enough. Fine airplane, not what it's built to do. And the P-38 had other issues which are complicated and I'm gonna talk about those another time. Again, fine airplane, just a whole bunch of things working against it here. So that leaves us with Thunderbolts and Mustangs. Well, the Thunderbolt was by far the bigger contributor during Big Week, largely because there were so many more of them. There were far more Thunderbolts, as the, the Merlin-powered uh, Mustang was pretty new on the scene. There were far more Thunderbolts, and they had far more air-to-air -air kills. I point this out because in nearly every article I see about Big Week, they talk about the P-51 as if it's the plane that made it all possible, and that's just not true. On the other hand, the Mustangs did make an impressive showing. They shot down more enemy aircraft per plane than the Thunderbolts. But I think that has more to do with the specific assignments it was performing and less to do with the effectiveness of the plane itself. That's all a little bit debatable, the part about uh, the effectiveness of the plane itself. From this point on, the Luftwaffe was in an unstoppable downward spiral, largely due to the lack of well-trained pilots. They were caught in the vicious cycle we talked about earlier, in which experienced pilots were lost, meaning they needed replacements. The new pilots had less training and less experience, thus they were killed off more quickly, uh, putting a further burden on the already overloaded Luftwaffe pilot training program. Let's talk about pilot training for a moment. At the start of the war, the Germans had pilot training that was at least as comprehensive as it was in any other air force in the world. Plus, they had a core of veterans with combat experience from the Spanish Civil War, and uh, they flew 109s in the Spanish Civil War, so that was pretty meaningful experience. As the war progressed, attrition started to take its toll. They lost a lot of pilots, in my opinion, wasted a lot of pilots in the Battle of Britain. There were further significant losses in North Africa and, of course, on the Eastern Front. Then, when U.S. daylight raids started, it got worse. Even by mid-1943, they were shortening their training program, and by D-Day, a new pilot's time in an operational airplane before going into combat 
had dropped from about 85 hours to about 20 hours, with only about 130 hours total time. I know for non-pilots out there, it's hard to understand just how little that is, but um, I guess to put it into perspective, in the United States, to get a commercial pilot's license, this would not get you a job necessarily, but to get a commercial pilot's license, you would have to have 200 to 250 hours, kind of depending on how you went about getting the rating. And obviously that doesn't include time spent operating weaponry or um, air-to-air -air combat stuff. Uh, 130 hours with only 20 hours in, in, in equivalent aircraft is really, really minimal. Even getting in that minimal amount of flight time was difficult. By mid-1944, P-51s were hunting all over Germany, making any daytime flying and training aircraft pretty close to suicidal. Thus, there was, there was very little time during the day when pilot training was reasonably safe, just around dusk and dawn. This creates more problems. It's even harder to get that 130 hours of total time when you can only fly a little bit each day. As an example, only four days before the end of the war, one of Germany's top test pilots, Melita von Stauffenberg, was shot down and killed by a P-51 while flying a training aircraft like the one pictured here. She was the sister-in-law of Klaus von Stauffenberg, who was famous for his attempt to assassinate Hitler. I was portrayed by Tom Cruise in a movie not too long ago. And um, Lita von Stauffenberg, she was a equivalent to Hannah Reich, who is another one that I would probably make that top 10 list we talked about earlier. Anyway, back to training numbers. 130 hours of total time with only 20 in combat aircraft is really minimal. For comparison, we can look at the training for U.S. fighter pilots. From the middle of 43 up until D-Day, a U.S. pilot would have about 320 hours of total time and about 120 in fighters before going into combat. Sounds about right to me in terms of what I think they should have. I recently read a great book about a P-47's pi uh, pilot's exploits. It's full of information I haven't run across before. Lots of little tidbits that only somebody that had been there and during that period would have known. It gives a good look at what a P-47 pilot went through from the point of view of a pilot who wasn't famous, wasn't an ace, just a brave pilot who did his part to win the war. Um, I do have the impression reading his book, he was quite a good pilot, though. Um, not because he says so, he doesn't say that. Perhaps uh, the most important part of the book from a historical perspective is how accurately the author documented his training experience. This was very helpful to me for this video. He started in 1943 when the war was well underway, and he went through what was considered an accelerated training program, which took about nine months. We're fortunate that he documented exactly how much time he spent in training and doing what. I'll add some text to this chart. As you can see, before going out on his first mission, he had 82 hours in the P-47 and over 300 hours of total time, so well over twice what a German pilot would have had during the same period. It's also worth noting that this was the accelerated program, which Lieutenant Beloga, the author, considered pretty minimal. He specifically talked about the minimal amount of gunnery practice, which seems to be a reoccurring theme among P-47 pilots. I've seen that mentioned several times by other Thunderbolt veterans, including Robert S. Johnson, um, which makes me think that was the norm. It's possible that was just because they knew the Thunderbolt's throwing so much lead out there anyway. We don't really need to focus on it that much. I don't know. Um, moving on. I know we went over a lot of stuff here so far. I'm going to summarize what we have at this point. The U.S. Army Air Force started to seriously focus on establishing air superiority in the middle of 1943 in preparation for D-Day. The importance of this was established in May of 1943 and put into effect no later than July. That's when we have documents for it. That gave the U.S. Army Air Force 11 months to get the job done. During at least nine of those 11 months, the P-47 was the most numerous U.S. fighter and did the most damage to the Luftwaffe, and by a huge margin. Thus, the P-47 is the fighter that did the most to establish air superiority and make D-Day possible. I think that alone makes it the most important Allied fighter on the Western Front and the most important Allied fighter in Europe, period we would be looking at a very different picture in terms of World War II from June 44 on had D-Day not happened for another year or so, let's say. Now, 
We can look at U.S. Army Air Force statistics to get a clear picture of the relative usage of the P-47 as compared with the P-51 or any other airplane. In 1943, over the Western Front, it's pretty much all P-47 Thunderbolt. As you can see in this chart, the P-51s in 1943 flew very few hours. Almost all of the hours they did fly that you see here were in Allison-powered A models, which couldn't fly escort duty. At first glance, it appears the P-40, correction, the P-38s were flying more time over Europe, but that's only because this chart is including the Mediterranean theaters, where P-38s were more active. Even so, from the fourth quarter of 1943 and on, the P-47s were flying far more. Let's look at 1944. In the first quarter, the P-47 was flying about four times more than the P-51, and in the second quarter, almost, almost twice as much. Thus, the P-47 was the dominant plane numerically and in terms of operational hours over Europe up until D-Day. During the second quarter of 1944, P-51s sh started showing up in really big numbers. As this happened, the P-51 started to displace the 47s from their escort role, and the Thunder Thunderbolts were being used more and more for ground attack missions, and it stayed that way up until the end of the war. This gave the P-51s more opportunities to shoot down enemy aircraft, and not only that, the aircraft they were shooting down were, on average, much softer targets than those the Thunderbolts had to contend with in 1943. This clipping is from Wikipedia, and it's exactly in harmony with USAAF data, so I think it's probably good. It shows that the P-51 destroyed 9,081 aircraft over Europe with 4,950 shot down on the ground. Uh, remember, due to Doolittle's uh, changes in tactics, fighters were free-ranging all over the airplane, all over the place, and if they didn't see anybody in the air, they'd go down on the deck and uh, shoot them up on the ground. Strangely, I couldn't find official numbers for the amount of aircraft shot down by P-47s. Only the total number of aircraft destroyed, um, including those on the ground. So we have to back calculate it and do the best we can, but that's okay. P-38s over Europe shot down fewer than 500 airplanes total. Spitfires and bow fighters flown by the USAAF, that's what we have statistics for, shot down a total of only 21 aircraft over Europe. We know that the P-51 shot down about half of the total number, so we subtract uh, the 4950 from 521, that's the number shot down by Spitfires and P-38s and bow fighters, and we get 4429 planes shot down by P-47s in Europe. I understand that number is going to be debatable, but I think the logic behind it is sound and reasonable. At Millville Army Airfield Museum, they have the following stats for the P-47. They show 11,878 aircraft destroyed, with half that shot down, which is 5839. Considering that the P-47 was also operated late uh, in the war in the Pacific theater, I think that makes the number of planes shot down I came up with over Europe at 4429 very plausible. So the P-47 definitely destroyed more airplanes in total than the P-51, and almost as many in the air. Furthermore, the targets destroyed... Um, well, let me back up and rephrase that. The P-47 destroyed more airplanes in total than the P-51, and almost as many in the air. But furthermore, the P-47 destroyed far more targets total, not just including aircraft, on the ground. Don't underestimate the effect of the fighter-bomber role and strafing attacks. German General von Rundstedt, who commanded the Western Army during the Battle of the Bulge, said, quote, But for the savage Allied strafing attacks, our counteroffensive would have driven to Paris, unquote. And he said that after he was captured by the Allies, so that wasn't some thing where he was trying to boast to Hitler to gain position or something. I think he really felt that, and I think he's right. He also wrote, and I am hugely summarizing here, that Allied air superiority made it almost impossible for the Germans to conduct effective military operations. On March 9th of 1945, he was relieved of command. Back to John Beloga's book for a moment. His first combat mission was right before D-Day. I think it was literally the day before. Um, 
and he flew a lot of missions, and yet he had no air-to-air -air combat with the Luftwaffe, and his squadron had very, very little, largely for two reasons. First, by that point, the Luftwaffe was in a weakened condition, and they were pushed back. Second, the P-47s were being used heavily for ground attack missions, for which it was much better suited than the P-51. Now, he did have a lot of harrowing missions. I think I referred to that earlier, uh, the scary stuff I read. He almost died several times. Uh, very brave guy. Some of the stuff he did, I would not want to try even without somebody shooting at me. My point is that the Thunderbolts were being used primarily in ground attack roles during the last year of the war in Europe, and that's the only reason the P-51 uh, passed them up in terms of air-to-air -air kills. So if the Thunderbolt was so great, why did the USAAF switch over to the Mustang? And they did switch over. By the end of the war, Mustangs had replaced all P-38 Lightnings in Europe and almost all P-47 groups, although there were still a fair amount of Thunderbolts in Europe. There are two main reasons for this. First, it was politically expedient for the reasons I talk about in Part 6 of this series. However, there is another reason, and it's a factor that's often overlooked when discussing World War II airplanes, and it's a really big factor. As you can see here, the P-47 was a very expensive airplane. The price went down as the war went on, but the USAAF could buy three Mustangs for the price of two Thunderbolts. Plus, the Mustangs used a lot less fuel, which was a factor since it had to be shipped across the Atlantic, the fuel that is. It did make economic and logistical sense to switch over to the Mustang, so um, I completely get why they did it. While I don't think the Mustang was a better airplane, I do think that switching over to it was logical, just not logical for the uh, official reasons that they give, which, again, we talk about all that in Part 6. Now, the Thunderbolt did participate in the Pacific Theater right up until the end of the war. However, in this series so far, I've really focused on the European Theater, and I don't want to get into the Pacific War stuff right now because it's just, it's just a very different war, different conditions, uh, different opponents. I'm probably going to talk about it in uh, upcoming videos as, as part of another series. So we're going to move on. We're going to skip over the Pacific War. Obviously, I know it, it happened, and the November model was designed really specifically for it to escort B-29s. Now, there were several times after World War II when piston-engine airplanes flew into battle again. The newly formed Israeli Air Force flew P-51s, Spitfires, and S-199s. That was a Czechoslovakian-built 109 with a Yumo 211 engine. Didn't have a lot of performance, wrong engine for the airplane, but they had to use it due to some other things I'm not going to get into. We also had the famous football war, which I discuss in my Corsair video. This war had Corsairs fighting Mustangs. Corsairs came out on top there. However, both of these conflicts saw relatively few sorties with World War II aircraft. In other words, they were relatively small scale. Over in Asia, however, there was a big conflict using World War II planes after World War II. This was the Chinese Civil War and the subsequent Taiwan Strait Crisis 1 and 2. I covered this in my previous video about the Top Gun controversy, um, so a lot of the details I'm not going to go over again here. But know that during that conflict, the Thunderbolt was heavily used by the Republic of China's Air Force. That's the country commonly known as Taiwan, and I'm going to refer to it as Taiwan to keep this straight. The Thunderbolt's primary problem, its high cost, became a moot point after the war. The U.S. was giving them away, and the Taiwanese Air Force loved them. The Taiwanese Air Force flew numerous types of late and post-World War II piston-engine airplanes, including the P-51H model, but replaced most of them with late model P-47Ds and Novembers. They preferred the Thunderbolts partially because they were more rugged and safer during ground attacks. Plus, they were very effective in air-to-air -air combat. The Thunderbolts had a very high kill ratio against mostly late World War II Soviet aircraft. The opposing Chinese communists even had some MiG-15s, which did shoot down two Thunderbolts, but a Thunderbolt shot down at least one MiG-15. Interestingly, the Thunderbolt pilot's primary anti-MiG tactic was not to dogfight it and try to shoot it down, 
but to try and run it out of fuel and running the clock, so to speak. What the Thunderbolt would do is dive down to low altitude, try and avoid the MiG's cannons long enough so the MiG would have to turn for home. And this worked pretty well because all jet engines, especially early jets and early MiGs, are relatively inefficient at low altitude. So the MiGs just couldn't stay in a fight very long down there, certainly not as long as a Thunderbolt. I think it's possible that some of those MiGs didn't get back to base. I think it's fair to speculate that dogfighting with Thunderbolts probably caused some MiG losses due to fuel exhaustion. Something like the Luftwaffe's 109 losses due to fuel exhaustion during the Battle of Britain. Those don't count as air-to-air -air kills, but uh, the effect is largely the same. Sadly, we don't have a great amount of detail about this conflict. Both sides, especially the Communists, were very secretive. I have seen a U.S. Air Force report that showed a 30 to 1 kill ratio in favor of Taiwan. I have not been able to find it, but if I do, I'll add it to the comments. Wikipedia shows a 31 to 1 kill ratio in favor of Taiwan during the period from 1946 to 1948, which was the time when they primarily operated Thunderbolts before they started to switch to uh, jet aircraft and uh, especially the F-86 Sabre. Thus, the Thunderbolt really closed out the age of piston engine fighter air-to-air -air combat with an incredible performance. Yes, there were some uh, impressive showings of Corsairs uh, and some other things later, but this was really the last big event with uh, piston engine fighters battling against each other in, on a large scale. For some reason, the 1946 to 48 Chinese Civil War and the subsequent Taiwan Strait crises are almost always ignored by history. The Strait crises are essentially continuations of that civil war, the first two of which had a lot of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground fighting, the third was just China's attempt to influence the Taiwan presidential election with intimidation by missiles. From a historical standpoint, this was a very interesting war. Not only did it feature the final generations of piston engine fighters, it had the early jets and the conflict saw the first use of air-to-air -air missiles. Taiwanese F-86s carried sidewinders, one of which hit a MiG and failed to explode. That MiG made it back to base, and the missile was reverse-engineered by the Soviets. That's one of the bigger uh, Cold War stories. There were also some tremendous amphibious assaults on some small islands controlled by Taiwan. In one of those operations, the Communist Chinese threw a large human wave attack against three Taiwanese tanks. This is very reminiscent of uh, early Red Army actions uh, during World War II, or at least stereotypical Red Army actions. Now, the tanks won, even after running out of ammo, which is pretty frightening. Uh, they just started running people over. Apparently, a USM-3 Stuart tank, which is a light tank, and it typically would be powered by twin Cadillac V8s, although I'm not sure what these had. There were options there. Anyway, apparently, a USM-3 Stuart tank can pretty easily run down soldiers on a beach, and that's exactly what they did. The tanks had some help from a nearby landing craft, which provided supporting firepower, picking off vessels from the uh, incoming invasion fleet. Ironically, the landing craft wasn't even supposed to be there, but the crew was hanging around working on their smuggling side gig when the Kami invasion fleet showed up. A U.S.-built, heavily armed World War II landing craft can make quick work of an invasion fleet when that fleet is made up of wooden junks and fishing boats, which is what the communist fleet was, and uh, consequently, that ship and crew became sort of unintentional heroes of the battle, which is kind of uh, kind of humorous, you know, when you think about it. They were there working on uh, just on smuggling and ended up being uh, national heroes. Moving on, now, that conflict was a really big deal. It was one of the few times that we know about that we almost ended up in a nuclear war. The Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, um, Taiwan Strait Crisis, and also, there was that one incident with that rogue Soviet uh, sub that was going to nuke Hawaii, but ended up blowing itself up. Anyway, uh, as I said, this conflict, the Taiwan Strait Crisis, was such a big deal that the U.S. almost nuked China over it. The U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended a nuclear strike on China. 
the U.S. Secretary of State said publicly that the U.S. was considering a nuclear strike. Uh, for those of you who maybe aren't uh, citizens in the U.S., the U.S. Secretary of State is a very high-ranking official. He's number three in the executive branch. It goes President, Vice President, Secretary of State. And uh, he's fourth in line overall. But in practical terms, and the only time in my lifetime the chain of command came into effect uh, was when President Reagan was shot. And Alexander Haig, who was Secretary of, of State at the time, basically said, well, I'm in charge now. So tells you the, and nobody, nobody disputed it. So that tells you the level of power the Secretary of State has. In any case, um, despite the advice from the Secretary, Secretary of State and uh, some admirals and the Joint Chiefs, President Eisenhower decided against uh, nuking China, thankfully. Here he is with that Secretary of State, by the way, uh, a couple of years later. I'll have to get back to our main topic here, but I think this entire conflict is hugely underrepresented on YouTube and everywhere else. After World War II, the Thunderbolt soldiered on in air forces throughout the world. It became popular because it was still effective in combat. Ironically, it was no longer at all effective in the role it was designed for, high-altitude air-to-air -air fighting. But in air-to-ground fighting, it was still a great choice, and it could hold its own in the air against anything but the new jet fighters, and it could often at least survive against those. Significantly, the U.S. was giving them away, and there were a lot of them. Peru was the last, the last country to uh, drop the P-47 from its Air Force. That was in 1966, so the Thunderbolt had a pretty good run. I want to thank all my supporters, especially those on Patreon. They got early access to this video, and I'm sending all Patreon supporters a link to a location with all my P-47 manuals and most of the other historical documents used in the creation of this series. I plan to do that with each new video, thus the next 190 video I'll send out. Um, when I put out that, I'll then send out the uh, info on the 190 manuals and so on. I've got to get them all onto some location, which is why I can't do it immediately. This is the final episode in the P-47 series, but we will be seeing more of the Thunderbolt in future videos on this channel as it's going to come up a lot for comparative purposes and, of course, when discussing historical events. I am really glad this series is done. Um, I chose the P-47 as the first plane to cover, at least cover completely in a series, because it's really the only World War II airplane that would enable me to fully explain, or at least explain to the extent that I want to, all the key aspects I want to cover, meaning it has a supercharger, it has an intercooler, it has a turbocharger, it has primitive fuel injection, um, various types of pilot protection, a uh, relatively high Mach number, and tons of test data from NACA on its limitations and flight characteristics. Thus, this was the plane that really had all the stuff in it I needed for a base series to cover all of this groundwork. And uh, all the extra primary source material for it really helped. So now that this series is done, I'm in a position to add new videos at a faster rate which a lot of people have been asking for. For example, it's going to be much easier to explain dive performance for the FW-190 or the de Havilland Mosquito because with the 47 series knocked out, in this case episode 2, uh, it's already provided all the groundwork for dive speed, so I don't need to explain uh, how Mach numbers, for example, work all over again for each airplane. Thus, uh, you're going to see FW-190 and the combined P-38 Mosquito series uh, progress at much faster rates than we saw in this Thunderbolt series. I think the Thunderbolt series took the better part of two years to get this done. That said, uh, technical and history buffs may be a little disappointed in my next two videos, but I simply have to make them. They're explaining some modern airline career stuff to, uh, to upcoming or prospective commercial pilots, uh, or even new commercial pilots. There's some stuff that's just getting left out of uh, of the information chain. Anyhow, those videos are going to be easy to make. They're not going to take very long, so they won't delay the uh, 190 video for too long. Thanks a lot for watching, and have a great day. Goodbye.